Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And uh, welcome to the session about the launch of the Global Drive for Media Freedom, Access to Information, and Safety of Journalists. Uh, my name is Barbara Triomfi, and I am Executive Director of the IPI, and I will be moderating uh, this session, which has excellent, very high level speakers. But maybe before we go into uh, the discussion itself, uh, um, I would like to show you a short video, which is uh, basically summing up the highlights uh, of the 2020 World Press Freedom Day conference uh, in uh, the, the, the Netherlands. So the video will last just three to four minutes and I'll see you after that. Of course, you've got words, but you've got a contribution as well. A contribution, as, as I understand, of 7 million euros. Um, in what way would you want to make a difference with that money? We will uh, be providing 7 million euros to the United Nations uh, to work together with them uh, on training programs. Yeah. Uh, for, for instance, for police officers in, in how to, to, to protect uh, journalists. Um, uh, training for journalists and also programs for the safety of journalists. Welcome to the World Press Freedom Conference 2020 in The Hague. We're in the World Forum here. The World Press Freedom Day and the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. There can be no press without freedom. The difference between truth and lies is the difference between life and death. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Without press freedom, freedom of expression being protected, you cannot have a true democracy. All other freedoms flow from it. To be able to question power, it's an essential condition. We should be open to criticism. I would like the world to be more aware about the threats that we as journalists are facing. Lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than facts. Press freedom to me means that I can do my job without having to consider my safety. Often what's missing is just political will or governments are making this enough of a priority. We need to extend a shield of protection to these journalists in all these many places. This important event is an opportunity. There was a time for analysis. Now time has come for action. It's critically important to look at motives behind why journalists specifically have been targeted. Enfrentarse al poder de un gobierno creo que es una de las batallas más duras pero más heroicas que un periodista puede dar. The power of the people is stronger than the people in power. So please, dear, dear audience, please join us. Join us in demanding justice. Join us in standing up. So welcome back, um, and so please allow me to introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, first of all, we have Ambassador Bahia Tazib Lee. She's human, human Rights Ambassador of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. We have Mr. Guy Berger, who is Director for Strategies and Policies in the field of Communication and Information at UNESCO. We have Ms. Peggy Hicks, uh, Director of the Thematics Engagement of the Special Procedures and Rights to Development Division of the OHCHR. And we have Mr. Matata Tzedu, who is the founder of the African Editors Forum. This, this session will discuss the implementation of uh, the Hague commitment thanks to a grant uh, that, as you know, the Netherlands has um, given to UNESCO and OHCHR um, of 7 million to do projects to enhance safety of journalists and promote freedom of expression. So let me turn to you, Ambassador uh, Tazeb. Um, 
what is the Hague commitment uh, and what, why did the Netherlands decide to put significant funding into supporting safety of journalists and freedom of expression? Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, I wish I was in Namibia like uh, some of you. Um, thank you, Barbara, for this question and also the opportunity really to explain a bit about the Hague commitment and the global drive. You know, the Hague commitment is really a, a Dutch political initiative to increase the safety of journalists all over the world, both online and offline. Almost 60 countries endorsed this call to action at the 2020 World Press Freedom Conference hosted by the Netherlands and UNESCO last December. The call is really crucial because delivering justice has a strong deterrent effect. And the Hague commitment really hits the nail on the head because global implementation is lacking. And the calls very goal really is to persuade more countries to effectively use and implement the international standards and to apply the tools that we already have. Put more colloquially, it's time to take the gospel to the streets because only then will we be able to make a real difference for press freedom and keep journalists safe. So to this effect, really, the Hague commitment offers some practical guidance on how to do so, like utilizing the universal periodic review, but also encouraging countries to really you know, live up to their commitments in the UN plan of action, to co-sponsor relevant resolutions at UN Human Rights Council and the General Assembly and support the UN special rapporteurs and available regional mechanisms. So we very much hope that many more countries will answer this call and I find it so empowering that the Windhoek, the 2021 World Press Freedom Conference is highlighting the importance of the Hague commitment. And this is what brings us together because we're here to launch the global, global drive for, for media freedom. Yes, what is the global drive all about? It's really about making the UN plan of action and the Hague committing, commitment living documents. And um, I also think this is a really a fitting contribution to next year's 10th anniversary of the UN Plan of Action. So um, yes, we will be collaborating, and it's a great honor to us, with UNESCO and OHCHR. These UN entities will be undertaking activities in about 22 countries. And such initiatives are not only important, they are so much needed in this testing and uncertain times. You asked about the significant funding that the Netherlands is putting into this effort. Why? I can say it in one sentence. We cannot allow sticks and stones to break the bones of free press. Journalists are essential. They're the oxygen of informed, democratic, and stable societies. So this is the reason why the Netherlands initiates and joins positive forces. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for that. And obviously, thanks to the Netherlands for not only for this initiative, but also for offering the funding to uh, support it. As you know, very much we need this type of implementation plan, well-funded implementation plan, in order to make sure that political commitment also become reality. Let me turn to um, Guy Berger. Um, Mr. Berger, UNESCO has been promoting freedom of expression and coordinating the UN Plan of Action on Safety of Journalists for many years. The UN Plan of Action will turn 10 next year. So, um, so you have a, obviously you have a lot, long experience in promoting safety of journalists, freedom of expression. How will the commitment and the funds from the Netherlands make a difference. So what is UNESCO planning to do with this in order to really make a difference for the journalists out there? Well, uh, thank you, Barbara, and hello from Vintuk. Uh, and uh, I know that you're calling uh, from uh, Vienna, which was the birthplace of the uh, UN Plan of Action 10 years ago. Um, I'm from, uh, I'm here in, in, in Namibia, which was 30 years ago, the birthplace of the World Press Freedom Day. And also significantly, I'm here, I'm wearing my, my special tie from last year, the World Press Freedom Day, which is a, a tie and the slogan says journalism without fear or favor, which was the theme of the World Press Freedom Day in the Netherlands last year. 
And it was at this World Press Freedom Day conference in the, in the Netherlands that the Hague commitments were adopted. So all these things fit together, you know, Windhoek, Vienna, the Hague. I mean, this is part of a, a worldwide momentum a movement to really try and make progress on press freedom and safety of journalists. Now, the Hague commitments, in many cases, one would find that states would make a, a, a very nice statement but it would stay at that level, it would stay as words and the words might evaporate over time. And what's significant now is that the Netherlands has put real money behind trying to get these Hague commitments uh, to be something that endures and something that really uh, can involve different stakeholders because there's some resources. And so at UNESCO, we're really pleased to be part of this uh, implementation of uh, these fine sentiments about safety of journalists and, and press freedom, which were agreed to by so many uh, ministers. And at UNESCO, we've had, a, a, well, we do have a program called the, the Multi-Donor Program for Safety of Journalists and Freedom of Expression. And this is how we will really be able to ramp up our work with this Dutch funding uh, to have many more countries and also more activities in existing countries uh, and hand in hand with the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, with whom we have also worked uh, closely with uh, up till now, but now together we can also take this um, to a, a higher level of impact. And very briefly, what will we do? So we'll do more work and we'll do it in more countries. And the first area of work is that as an intergovernmental organization UNESCO we can work with the governments and so we have this model of PPP which is prevent protect and prosecute so prevention we work with governments but also then with our civil society and the media to really promote things like World Press Freedom Day which is today and we promote the International Day to end and impunity for crimes against journalists on the 2nd of November. And this is about prevention. It's about creating the climate that it's not normal for journalists to be attacked. The, normal, the norm has to be that journalists are respected and, and, uh, and their right to do their job is cherished and that they are, are in, indeed supported. So the prevention side is really important of the work we do by raising awareness, by actually getting um, particularly the duty bearers to commit to uh, a, an enabling environment of law and culture and political statements and rhetoric that will stop attacks on journalists. And we know that's not enough. So we also then push for protection, particularly gender sensitive forms of protection, uh, that of course the state should be protecting everybody and the state should protect journalists from attacks and particularly women journalists. And that's complex because now so many of these attacks are online. And then the third P after prevent and protect is to prosecute. And here we really do a lot of work and I can speak a, speak a little bit more about it later, but in trying to make sure that the rule of law applies so that anybody, uh, whether in government or out of government, whether official or non-official, anybody who is violating the rights of journalists can be prosecuted and should be prosecuted. Uh, because without that, then these other issues uh, are not uh, sufficient. So that's what we do at country level. And then we also work at, at, at country level, not only with the duty bearers, the, the governments and uh, judges and prosecutors and security forces, but we also work with the media. And that's really important. And of course, the media uh, and the civil society, they play a key role in this. And they, they, they are advocates for these rights. And they also are working to protect uh, themselves and get media companies to have decent policies. And the last thing I would then say that we'll do with this is uh, leading up to this 10th anniversary and beyond of the, of the UN plan of action, we will be really working at a global level on strengthening this UN plan as a framework for all different actors to get involved. That's academics, international organizations, UN organizations. And in particular, what I think is, is gonna be new and possible under this um, new support from the, from the Dutch who've joined this multi-donor program at the UNESCO is that in tandem with the High Commission of Human Rights, we're going to be really trying to strengthen the UN country teams 
in every country, the UN works uh, in its special mandates, it's, its division of labor, but there's a country team as well. And so what we want to do is really ramp up the effectiveness of the UN working as one at country level uh, under this. And this is something that we have had aspirations to do, but we haven't had a chance. Uh, to have the resource to do it up to now. So that's the exciting stuff that we are going to be rolling out from UNESCO hand in hand with the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights. Back to you, Barbara. Thank you very much for that. This sounds very ambitious and I and and indeed I think the past nine years of plan of actions have showed us how important it is to operate at country level and uh, and to work hand in hand with civil society additionally to, of course, government and state institutions. So let me turn to um, Peggy Hicks, Ms. Hicks. Um, so OHCHR will be uh, the other big uh, organizations implementing uh, this, um, this uh, effort. Um, how do you plan to use the funding and specifically for the journalists and civil society representative out there, how will this make a difference for them? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much, Barbara. It's, it's great to be with you. Thanks to UNESCO, to Guy, uh, Matata, uh, looking forward to hearing from you. This is a really exciting project for our office. We, we like you, see a world in which uh, media freedom is under attack and under and media organizations and uh, those within them are under resourced. And we also see um, at the time of this pandemic, at the time of, of global crises, exactly the importance of journalists and media freedom. We need truth, we need truth tellers, uh, we need solid investigation more today than ever before. Um, so this, this partnership gives us an opportunity to really move forward on some crucial initiatives. So the way OHCHR will take this up, again, within that same 3P framework that, that Guy outlined, um, we have field presences, um, offices working with those UN country teams Guy mentioned to really ask them where are their needs? What do they need from us to be able to better help journalists and uh, media organizations on the ground? So we've developed programs in some 17 countries reflecting those needs. And we're working with local civil society, with journalist organizations and looking at areas in different contexts. In some places, you know, on conflict places, the needs are one thing. In other places, we're looking at places of political transition, places where there are social protests or racial justice issues, and really trying to give them targeted assistance that, that really takes up those issues. Um, and some of the countries involved, you know, range from Iraq, Cameroon, Bangkok, Peru, Mexico, um, Beirut, Tunisia, just a sampling of some of the places will be active. One of the key planks there is to build up what we call protection networks. And that's really to find ways to support the local journalists and, and media associations so that they are better able to action their own needs uh, within their societies. But I wanna emphasize that part of that effort is to foster a free media. We need to build up um, a, a set of laws uh, that really protect them. And so we're working on that side of the equation but then on the other side, we need a whole of society approach. We need everybody in society to want to protect uh, journalists and the media as much as we do. So we need to engage across a broad range of institutions and engage with the public to, to really show the value of the importance of journalism and free media. And so we have a number of activities there. Finally, as the UN's Human Rights Office, we have the opportunity to be a global advocate to bring these issues forward in sometimes a, a way that, that can you know, be in the face of those who are taking steps that restrict media freedom and speak out forcefully on the cases where journalists are, are threatened in a variety of contexts. Um, and we intend to do that using both the voice of our High Commissioner for Human Rights, but also the independent mechanisms that the Human Rights Council has set up, including, for example, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Peggy. And, and um, indeed, the, 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 this public statement, uh, even repeatedly, you know, stating the principles, we feel is so important to remind governments and everybody out there of, you know, what we have committed to and uh, and uh, and and what is what are our values as well. 
Um, you all have spoken about the importance of civil society and journalists in this process. Let me turn to uh, Matata Tseidu. Um, you know, almost 60 countries uh, have endorsed the Hague commitment on safety of journalists, including a few countries in Africa, I believe Zimbabwe, Rwanda, um, and there is a pledge to investigate and prosecute all forms of attacks against journalists. Uh, what role do you, Matata, see for civil society, for media institutions and for journalists? And what, what results do you hope this will achieve? Well, um, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Barbara, for, for, for this opportunity and greetings to all the other panelists. Um, I represent the African Editors Forum, which is a body of editors, and media educators uh, throughout the continent. Um, <clears throat> and it's an organization that was founded in 2003, launched in 2005, and is dedicated towards enhancing media freedom on the continent and uh, improving the standards of journalism. So as part of the work that TIEF does uh, around uh, media freedom, we partnered with uh, UNESCO uh, last year. Uh, and uh, this year we launched the digital platform for the protection of journalists, which is uh, a, an instrument that is instantly able to pick up uh, alerts about attacks on journalists and uh, <clears throat> then spread the information around. But the, the, the big difference between just spreading the information around is that uh, the platform has a link with the special rapporteur for freedom of expression of the AU at the Commission for Human and People's Rights. And uh, <clears throat> the, the special rapporteur then takes up those issues with the member states that are involved. And this is really quite crucial. So when one looks at uh, the funding from the, the Dutch and um, what is it that could be done, there are, <clears throat> the, the, the key thing is mobilizing uh, public opinion uh, to, 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 pr to put pressure on governments to live up to all these lofty ideals that they've signed up to, but which they just sign at this august ceremonies and then go home and uh, pretend they didn't commit to anything. So th th there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done at uh, country level that, that um, the platform, for example, is a mechanism that could be used for that. Thank you for so that. There are, also, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. there are also issues around training uh, uh, and legal representation, because when people have been picked up, what do you do? Where do you get the lawyer? How do you pay the lawyer? Those are crucial things that I hope the Dutch Fund uh, will be able to assist with. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, and yeah, and I couldn't agree more that journalists are also there to hold their governments accountable, accountable for their commitment. Uh, and, and, and so their role in this process is absolutely <clears throat> key to make sure that uh, the commitments are also implemented and bring, bring about positive change. Let me go back to um, Ambassador Tazib. Um, you know, journalists, as Mutata has highlighted, are facing an increasing amount of threats and attacks. The, the COVID-19 crisis has made the situation out there even worse. So, so a few years from now, we will look back at this moment when the global drive for media freedom, access information and safety of journalists was launched. And, uh, you know, but by then, what do you think and what do you believe truly that the, this, this global drive, what are the changes, so the positive changes that this global drive will bring about for the journalists out there, but obviously for our communities out there? Thank you, Barbara, for your uh, question. And um, uh, before immediately um, answering your question, you mentioned looking back. So um, I would like to have just a few seconds to first, you know, really to pay tribute to the unflinching African journalists who drew up 
the historic Windhoek Declaration three decades ago. And I find it really so meaningful and also moving that the World Press Freedom Conference is coming home now. And 30 years onwards, we are surely, we can surely say that progress has been made uh, regarding media freedom and especially in terms of raising awareness and the development of international standards and tools. So I just wanted to emphasize this point first. At the same time, however, we all know we're seeing press freedom, the safety of journalists and access to information really declining worldwide. And that is extremely alarming and simply unacceptable. We see every year hundreds of journalists and media workers are being attacked, killed and imprisoned simply for doing their job, for reporting the facts, which are of great importance to all of us. And um, I would also like to especially highlight women journalists. Almost two thirds of women journalists all over the world have been threatened or harassed online. It's shocking when I speak and listen to their stories, it's shocking how threats of rape and physical violence and graphic imagery show up in their inboxes and on their social media accounts as they go about their daily work. In addition, some politicians are harming journalists further with anti-media rhetoric. So to get back to your, the essence of your question, how can we change this trend? trend? I cannot, of course, come up with a whole list, but I'll give you three examples of how I think we can change the trend and push for an effective, diverse, and inclusive media landscape, because this is really the goal, an inclusive, diverse, and independent media landscape. Well, first of all, as we can see today, working together really pays off. And that is why the Netherlands invests in building coalitions and joining forces with like-minded countries and partners, raising our voices together is more powerful and effective than making individual statements. Second, keeping press freedom high on the international agenda. That's really crucial. And that's why we're here at the Winter Conference and launching the global drive for media freedom in partnership. Third, as you said so clearly and so eloquently, we need to keep on supporting civil society. They have a critical role. It's vital to have an active, strong and diverse civil society that speaks out. And it's incredibly important to listen to what they are saying because they know what's happening on the ground. So these are some uh, examples that I would like to share with you all in order to really work towards this uh, independent, inclusive and diverse media landscape. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Bahia, for that. Let me, let me then pick up on that and turn to um, Guy um, Berger, also in terms of working with civil society, but also with other players uh, who can uh, play an important role in uh, uh, fighting impunity that, as we know, is one of the, the, the key issues in the fight for safety of journalists. Um, last year in, uh, at the Hagen Conference, UNESCO presented a set of guidelines for prosecutors on cases of crimes against journalists. That seems to be a key aspect of the promotion of safety. Tell us a little bit more about this, Guy, if you may. Thank you. And if I can just put this in context a little bit, uh, this question of legal uh, troubles facing journalists, uh, from the UNESCO side, what we will use these uh, Dutch funds for is mainly to impact on uh, the capacity of stakeholders to promote reform of the laws under which the journalists are being prosecuted. And also like training the judges about jurisprudence, for example, jurisprudence of the African court on human people's rights about uh, Norbert Zongo, famous African journalist who was assassinated. The, this is jurisprudence that needs to be spread around the, uh, the continent and indeed uh, international jurisprudence as well. So uh, we uh, at UNESCO will use the Dutch funds more for this uh, this kind of work. But I, I want to say in response to Matata Tedu, for the emergency issues, um, UNESCO also has a, a, a global legal defense fund, which was set up under a, an earlier initiative than the Hague commitment. Um, and this is an initiative that was a global pledge for media freedom that was led by the UK and Canada. 
who then created the Media Freedom Coalition, of which the Netherlands is a member. And I think what's significant now, if you put all these things together, is that there's a, a bit of a snowball here because, and a complementarity involved. Uh, the snowball is that, you know, the, by joining at UNESCO the, the multi-donor program, the Dutch are setting an example that, you know, one needs to have money to, to, to do things. Uh, with this Global Legal Defense Fund, UK and Canada have set an example. One needs money to, to make uh, this thing a reality. And uh, I think with this now also, uh, OSCHR will also benefit from a, a bit of a snowball effect that states have to put, you know, uh, their, their, their money where their mouth is if they're going to make these commitments uh, real. And indeed, the more signatories, the better, you know, for example, the Hague commitments, if um, in a year's time, there's more countries signed up, one, that's more countries showing willingness to cooperate in this issue, but some of them will also put some more money into it. And, and in the end, that is what's so important, because we have to cover all these issues, the structural issues of law, of jurisprudence and then also the emergency issues now on the on this particular question of the prosecutors barbara and i won't be too long here um, with this new resource what unesco will do is amplify its online training course that we developed with the international association of prosecutors about how prosecutors can play such an important role in prosecuting those who are uh, charged or alleged with crimes against journalists. And this is something that we've just begun to start out and now we'll be able to do this a lot more. And this is, is one element in the legal picture because over the past five years, we've managed to train more than 18,000 judges and judges are playing a different role because obviously they hear the evidence, but judges need to know the jurisprudence on this thing. Prosecutors bringing the case and judges are really there, even when it's the state bringing the case uh, against journalists, judges need to know. But so we've trained 18,000 judges in about 60 countries and we've trained law enforcement uh, about 8,500 in 20 countries. Uh, and now we're really going to be ramping those up, but especially putting energy into training prosecutors, which has been a a kind of weaker link in this whole chain up to this point. So thanks to this this fund, that's what uh, UNESCO will be able to do. That's um, fantastic. And, and that's really, really um, important. Let me um, let me turn to um, to Peggy Hicks. You know, uh, you also mentioned the work at the national level and in particular with national human rights institutions, which seems so key and so important for the really to make a difference at the national level. What, um, what do you expect to be able to do thanks to this additional fund in the coming years? Thanks very much, Barbara. Just to pick up on what Guy was saying, if we wanna change the way media freedom works on the ground, there has to be accountability for attacks on journalists and there has to be better legal protection for not just journalists as, as so defined, but the broader ecosystem of access to information and free information. Remember, there are also um, human rights defenders who are protecting the space for media to work and that whole ecosystem needs to be protected. To do that, we need better institutions doing the monitoring and reporting on what is happening. What do those attacks look like? Who's perpetrating them? And what we are going to do is work with national human rights institutions to better equip them to take on some of those roles in their own societies. So it will allow us to have that information base that better feeds into the types of prosecutions and other efforts and to stronger laws that we need to, to make this all work. So we do things like engaging in strategic lawsuits against public um, participation uh, called SLAPs with our, um, with our partners, really taking on the, the, the ways in which this space is limited. And just to also pick up uh, Ambassador Deep's comment about women journalists and women in this ecosystem, we also have a particular focus on the way that uh, the environment is that much more dangerous for women and how can we also make sure that the ways in which women journalists have been particularly targeted for, for violence and attack are, are part of the equation as well and that we respond appropriately. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We only had a couple of minutes still, but I would still like to hear from um, Tatha Tzedu on, uh, you know, you heard about great, we heard about great commitment um, 
but also very concrete plans on the side, not only of the Netherlands, but also UNESCO and OHCHR. Uh, looking at all this from the point of view of the journalists, uh, civil society, you know, journalist safety includes various aspects, legal, physical, psychological, digital attacks, all of that. If you could, as you can, recommend to UNESCO, your, your OHCHR and the Netherlands, how to prioritize their work, what activities do you think would be most urgent in order to make sure journalists can carry out their work? Thanks, Mikhail. No, thank you. Uh, the, the ecosystem around safety, it's not just the physical, as it's been said here, there are all these uh, online threads that come through, but on our continent, in the main, you're still faced with uh, a lot of physical threats. Uh, that, that that happened. You can look at what is happening in uh, Tigray in Ethiopia. This is a prime minister who is uh, a recent uh, recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, but his government is at the center of the harassment of journalists, even from a, a renowned international institution like the BBC. So it shows the kind of impunity that governments feel. So it's very important that these resources that we're talking about here are available and are able to be brought down to nation level, state level, so that people are trained uh, on uh, <clears throat> how to deal with threats, physical threats, how to actually do better journalism, because sometimes the threats come from bad journalism. And with the advent of uh, <clears throat> online uh, mechanisms, everybody has sort of like become a journalist, quote unquote. Uh, <clears throat> so the training becomes quite important. And uh, from the side of African editors, we're hoping that uh, these resources that we're talking about here will be able to deal with this sort of issues. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for this. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of the time we have available for this session today, but I would really like to thank our speakers for uh, um, helping us understand the work that you will be carrying out in the coming months and years on, around this, but also understand what is needed, what is the most, uh, what are the priorities that we should look at. Uh, thank you so much to um, Bahia Tatib, uh, Guy Berger, Peggy Hicks, uh, and Matata Seydou. And I would like to close by just mentioning again, as our speakers have, how important uh, the window of declaration has been for the past 30 years, uh, and how, how great it is to that UNESCO goes back to window to celebrate this and very much hope that the hack hate, sorry, the hate commitment will be an equally strong tool to support journalists. Thank you everybody for being thank with you. us and thanks to our speakers.